Hi there. Today, a top 11 list called TDC, or Too Damn Cheap, <laughs> if that's even possible. In this list, you'll find gear that pros love, but this gear won't crush your wallet. Well, not as badly as some of the nosebleed gear I've already made videos about, like in the too damn expensive episode. This is kind of the opposite of that episode. I also released two other episodes with inexpensive and value priced gear. If you haven't seen those episodes, you might be missing out. There is a lot of value priced, great gear in those episodes. Several viewers recommended I do this episode. Fortunately, it was already in the works. So let's do this. Coming in at number 11, Diodario String 10-pack. These go on sale from time to time for $39.99 at Guitar Center and other retailers. Buying a 10-pack can save you some serious bucks. Guitar players can be finicky about their strings. I know this, but at $40, these strings are a great deal. And personally, I actually like Diodario. Usually you'll pay $7 for a single set. These 10 packs are about half price. I purchased four sets of 10 about 20 years ago, and I still haven't used all of them. Now, they're individually wrapped inside. Now, guitar players know this. They're not going to go bad like milk or oxidize. They're individually wrapped, so they're sealed. I think I only paid $29.95 for mine. I even got a free guitar tuner with each set. Four guitar tuners. They weren't very good guitar tuners. I gave most of them away. I recently saw a 25 pack on Amazon for $113.79. That's a great deal too. At number 10, studio desk and chair. This is a weird one, I know, and it's really a Jeffy thing. I threw it in because studio desks and chairs can be expensive. The simple desk that I use costs about $1,500. And if you can't really see it there, I'll throw in a good picture. But I only paid $100 for it. It's got a heavy duty steel frame and a one and a quarter inch laminated top. I live in Silicon Valley and high tech startup companies spend ridiculous amounts of money on office furniture. When they go bust, they sell furniture for pennies on the dollars. And it doesn't really matter where you live, there are always companies doing this. You should look in used furniture stores for tables, desks, and chairs that suit your needs. Don't spend high prices at Staples or Office Depot for subpar furniture. Great condition used office furniture by big name suppliers such as Steelcase and Vitra are generally better constructed. The chair I have is a Metapro by Vitra. I'll throw up a picture in a minute. It's a very basic looking chair, but chairs like this cost $150 to $400 used on eBay or $700 plus new. I paid $15 for it from the same place I purchased the table. Am I a cheapskate? Yes, I am, <laughs> but I'm also frugal. Previously, I used an office desk with a shelf for the monitor, and this story might be helpful for some folks. I purchased some rack rail at a music store, probably Sweetwater, and created my own racks right in the desk. Here's a picture of that old setup. Strangely, there are two other items in this picture that appear in this list. Home Depot had pieces of melamine laminated particle board that I used for the verticals to which the rack rail is bolted. I also used it for the top shelf on which the monitor sat, and it matched perfectly. I did buy the original desk at Office Depot for $59.95 on sale, but I modified it to suit my needs. This was like 20 plus years ago. You can do this. With the rack rail and the melamine, it probably cost me another $30, and it would be a little bit more than that today. All you need are some basic carpentry skills. You can cut rack rail with a hacksaw or use a compound miter saw with a metal cutting disc, which is what I did. Sweetwater actually sells rack rail in all kinds of lengths. It used to be cheaper to buy it in longer lengths and then cut it yourself, but now it costs about the same to buy the lengths you need. You can buy two sets of six space rack rails for $14.99 each, which is what you see as far as spaces in the rack I custom made. So that would be a total of about $30. 
I gave that table away, which is kind of a shame. Coming in at number nine, Countryman Type 85. It's a direct box. It's a high quality, built like a tank direct box. And if you have a serious studio, you know you're going to need a direct box. A mono unit will set you back $229. A stereo unit will set you back $285. Here's the one I own. If they'd had a stereo unit, I probably would have bought it at that time. Mine's a mono unit. The embarrassing thing is mine looks brand new and I've owned it for at least 25 years. I've been to oodles of studio. Every direct box I've ever seen at commercial studios looked like it had been through World War III. Often they have been sitting on the floor in a room, getting dragged around by cables, kicked by musicians, stomped on, and worse. I had always thought the company was out of Nashville. It's called a country man. <laughs> I just naturally assumed that. It wasn't until I made this video and I looked on the side closely at the writing, the company is in Redwood City, California. That's in Silicon Valley, about 20 miles from where I live. Who knew? At number eight, Sure SM57. Everyone knows the SM57, or, or they should. It's a cardioid dynamic microphone. It has a frequency response of 40 hertz to 15 kilohertz. Of course, there's a big roll off on the low end, starting at about 200 hertz, and on the top end, starting at around about 10K. This can have advantages in live situations and in the studio when miking mid-range instruments like voice and guitar. What some people may not know about the SM57 is that it is heavily faked, and I mean heavily, and the fakes use significantly inferior components. For a lot of people, without having a real one in one hand and having the fake in the other, it would be impossible to tell a real one from a fake one. The knockoff companies get better at faking them every year. A real SM57, and this one is a real one, can be purchased for around $89. It's worth buying one from a reputable store like Sweetwater. It's well made and it will last a lifetime. Buying one used on eBay or Reverb is a gamble. Pros love the SM57, especially studio engineers and pro guitarists. They will use an SM57 along with a Royer R121 to mic guitar speaker cabinets. A Royer R121 is not on this list. It's a ribbon mic costing around $1,500. Later in this episode, I'll tell you how I mic my monstrous cabinet on a budget. The SM57 is a value mic. Consider it. Number seven. 3M duct tape. Whether you call it gig tape or duct tape, it doesn't matter. When I was playing live, I was always asking other musicians to let me buy some of their, or borrow some of their gig tape. Not buy it, they, I wanted to borrow it. I never had much money back then. Keyboards were expensive, right? Uh, <laughs> I owe a lot of people duct tape. Anyway, it stops your guitar pedals, keyboard pedals, drum pedals from running away from you. There's a lot of brands out there. Some claim to leave no residue and charge ridiculous prices. Perhaps there's one that truly delivers on the claim, but I find that they don't stick very well. You can get a 1.88 inch wide roll that's 50 yards long of good 3M basic gray duct tape at Home Depot for $7. Coming in at number six, a pop screen. A good pop screen is a must for a recording studio, especially when you're recording vocals. You can pay $10 to over $100 for a pop screen. A lot of people don't know really what to look for when they're looking for a pop screen. So perhaps I can help with that. Here's the one that I own. The first thing to look for is the material that the screen is made from. You want one where the screen is flexible and not really hard. Some screens are made from multiple layers, often as many as four layers. 
Generally, good material is smooth to the touch when you run your finger across it, and it feels soft. Most people think the idea behind a pop screen is to stop plosives, that p sound that just pops the diaphragm on the microphone. That is accurate, but incomplete. It also stops specks of saliva getting on and into your expensive condenser microphone. The second thing to look for is the clamp that attaches the pop screen to the mic stand. Some have a bar like this, and personally I like that because it gets the screen immediately away from the mic. Some aren't made very well and will keep sliding down when you try to tighten them. Make sure there's metal components in the clamp. The third thing, <laughs> the third thing, uh, thought putty cat. The third thing to look for is the actual screen enclosure itself. Good ones are two concentric circles and they have this adjuster here. What that actually allows you to do is to take the unit apart and replace the screen. The screen is actually held in with friction. Some just have a replaceable element, but generally it's just screen, it's a screen portion held in with friction. This also allows you to adjust it this way. A good pop screen by Sure will cost you about 40 bucks. On Stage makes one for about 26 bucks. And when I was making this video, it was actually on sale at Sweetwater for I think $14.99. So that would be a good deal. Another thing about pop screens is you can buy a pop screen for 10 bucks. And that's probably going to serve you well. If you're careful, and you don't work in a highly trafficked studio that has blind porcupines in it, you're never going to have to replace the screen, the screen material on your uh, pop screen. So you don't really need to think about that. Uh, I should have also said that this one has a 12 inch gooseneck, which makes it easier to get the, the screen exactly where you need in front of the mic. That's more important and hard to do on some screen screens that aren't well made. So you want to be sure of that. And that's really about it for pop screens. Number five, Craig Laboratories Deoxit or any good quality contact cleaner. If you own outboard gear and especially if you own classic scents with lots of sliders and circular potentiometers, aka pots, you've probably had one that became scratchy. A little spray of Deoxit will probably take care of that. Deoxit has been a trusted product used by electronics enthusiasts, professional repair shops, and pro musicians for years. Most of the time, you can squirt a little into the potentiometer from the outside. This is generally true for sliders and rotary potentiometers. For guitar players, it works great for scratchy pickup switches. I use it on my guitars when they get scratchy. In some cases, you may need to open up the device to get better access to the scratchy component. And a lot of rotary potentiometers actually have a little kind of like little hole where you can squirt some in. Once you've squirted it in, just slide it backwards and forth or rotate it around if it's a, if it's a circular one, and that should take care of it. This is Deoxit, and you get a five ounce can for about $17. This is a generic brand that I bought years ago when I couldn't find this one, <laughs> that I found it. But I think this was about eight or $10, and I think they're a little bit more. They're about the same price now, but you get a, I think you get 12 ounces in this, and they both work well. But Deoxid is the, probably the, the big brand that everybody knows of. And that's pretty much it for contact cleaner. Number four, GT730. You probably didn't think there would be a PC graphics card on this list. Let me tell you why it's on here. If you're solely a musician who doesn't play high-end video game titles on your computer and you need to run multiple HD or 4K monitors, this is a bargain choice. For $70 to $105, you can run up to four monitors on your PC using this card. Some are passively cooled, meaning they don't have fans that sound like an SR-71 preparing for a takeoff. A lot of people record in the same room as their computer, so a version without a fan won't add any fan noise. This one is passively cooled. That's, that's the heat sink right there. 
There are several other variants of this card. The first specification to be aware of is the amount of memory the card has. Some cards have two gigabytes, others have four gigabytes of RAM. It may sound counterintuitive, but the two gigabyte cards are generally better because they use DDR5 and not the older DDR3. The second specification to be aware of relates to the ports on the card. There are many versions. Some have four HDMI ports, which is the one I have. Others have the same number or fewer ports with combinations of HDMI, DisplayPort, and DVI. These are usually the older cards with the DDR3 and 4 gigabytes of RAM. Obviously, you should buy a card that has the ports that match the inputs of your monitors. The version I have with 4 HDMI ports is called the GT730-4HSL-2GD5. It's currently $99.23 on Amazon. I think when I purchased mine a couple of years ago, it was like $89. So it hasn't gone up much. The older cards with the DDR3 and a combination of ports are closer to $75. My understanding is that card I have will run monitors in 4K, but I'm limited to 30 hertz refresh. What I mean by that is a 30 hertz refresh rate rather than the 120 hertz refresh rate. That shouldn't be a problem for musicians since we are not gaming. We're mostly looking at static screens and or possibly a screen with a timeline on it that is moving very slowly. Ultimately, as a single card in a system to give a musician four monitors at a budget price, it's a winner. Number three, AKG C1000S. This is a small diaphragm condenser mic. They are currently on the Mark IV, which is black in color. I own three of these mics and all of them are champagne in color. That's because I bought them decades ago. Pros love this little mic for all kinds of applications. As a mic in a multi-mic setup for miking drums, usually for miking the mid-range, so toms. In an X configuration, to mic acoustic sources like classical nylon and steel string guitars, which is an application I've used them for from time to time. Also using this mic with a Shure SM57 to mic guitar speaker cabinets. Now the pro choice would be to use a Royer R-121 ribbon mic with the 57 and not the AKG, but I've had good success with the AKG and Shure combo. Also, the Royer is $1,500 and the AKG is $250. So it's affordable with great quality for the price. It has a frequency response range of 50 Hertz to 20 kilohertz. Its response is pretty flat from about 250 Hertz to around three kilohertz, which is why I like it and pros like it because it's flat across the mid range. Pickup patterns include cardioid and hypercardioid when using the included PPC-1000S polar adapter that slips over the mic element. Maximum SPL with 0.5% total harmonic distortion is 137 dB. The max SPL for the Royer is about the same. Obviously, there's more than SPL to consider when miking a guitar speaker cabinet, but know that you can crank up the speaker and the AKG will take the loudness just as well as the Royer. It runs off of phantom power or a battery, which makes it a nice quality field microphone. The older mics take a 9 volt rectangular battery. The new mics take two AA batteries and claim to have up to 120 hours of operational time. For its size, it's heavy, and you can feel the quality when you hold it. I purchased two of the mics in a package, and they came in these containers. When I purchased them, it was $250 for two of them, and they came in these containers. I'll just take them out here, but that was probably 20 plus years ago. I don't know if you can get them in these containers anymore. You probably can, but I don't know. You have your um, mic clip here. 
you have the little widget thing. Somebody once called it a widget. This slips over to give it that hypercardioid response. And when you see the mic element, you'll know what I mean. Here's the mic. So this is what the mic looks like. It has an on-off switch on it, which is kind of handy. And uh, it just unscrews. It's very heavy, very well made. And there's the element on the, on the top here. And then you slide the little uh, hypercardioid uh, dongle over it or widget. You can see mine has a nine volt battery in it, not the two double A's, but um, it works just fine. I've owned these mics for, like I said, at least 20 years. Use them a lot for miking acoustic guitars. And while there are better mics now, you know, back then these were really great and they're still great and they're very affordable. At number two, Bear Dynamic DT770 headphones. Pros and everybody I've met love these headphones. DT770s are venerable. Next year, they will have been in production for 40 years. I have two pairs that I've owned for about 35 years, and they are the 250 ohm model. The models include 32 ohms, 80 ohms, and 250 ohm versions. There's also another one, and I'll get to that in a moment. Replacement parts are readily available. I have replaced the headband, the ear cushions, a couple of times on these headphones. From constant use, the headbands decay, and the ear pads wear and turn a brassy color from sweat and oils from people's skin. The ear pads start out as gray in color. They are great quality with superior definition and excellent bass response the best bass response I've ever heard in a pair of headphones. They are closed back, super comfy to wear for long periods of time, and perfect for isolation when recording acoustic sources in the studio. A set will cost you $169. There is a limited edition model called the Pro X, which has a detachable cable and special lettering. But sonically, the specs are the same, except the Pro X are 48 ohms. Don't buy the Pro X on Amazon for $269. If you want the Pro X, get them at Sweetwater for $199 or $219.99 with the hard carrying case. Quick true story. For over 20 plus years, I recorded demos with a friend. One day his wife called me to ask if I could suggest a music gift for her husband. I think it was for his birthday. I told her to buy the DT770s. He was always using mine and I knew he liked them. Did she purchase the 770s? No, she got him DT990s, which she probably thought would be better. I mean, obviously 990s are 220 better than 770s, right? Unfortunately, the 990s are open back, so they are useless for isolation purposes. Moral of the story, you can share your advice with people, but don't expect them to value it or follow it. I tell you this story now so you won't make the same mistake. And so you might consider subscribing to get me to a thousand subscribers. We're almost at the number one. Before I tell you what it is, I did want you to know that I seriously considered making the DT770s number one. They truly deserve it. But unfortunately, the number one deserves it more. And this is it, the Shure SM58. I think a lot of people knew this was coming. Pros love this microphone. Similar to the SM57, it's a cardioid dynamic microphone. It has a frequency response of 50 hertz to 15 kilohertz. Of course, there's a big roll off on the low end and the high end, just like the SM57. This is the world's most popular live vocal mic. Because of that, and like the SM57, what some people may not know is that the Shure SM58 is heavily faked, and the fakes use significantly inferior components. They come in a very convincing box, but only a real SM58 performs like an SM58.
For a lot of people without having a real one in your other hand, it's impossible to tell a real one from a fake one. And even when you do have a real one and a fake one side by side, it's still not easy. I can't tell the difference. The knockoff companies get better at faking them with every generation. A real SM58 can be purchased for around $89 or $93 if you want an on-off switch. It's worth buying one from a reputable retailer like Sweetwater. It's well made and it will last you a lifetime. Buying one used on eBay or Reverb is a gamble. I wouldn't do it, but it's up to you. You used to be able to find fakes discounted on these sites, but that became a tip-off that they were fake. Most of the time they are simply listed for retail, or a dollar or two less. The SM58 is a great mic and a great value. Hopefully I haven't wasted your time. Take care, and I'll be back in another episode soon.